Coming up on DTNS, Amazon's got a third-party quality control problem, DoorDash updates its driver tipping policy, and Denmark revisits flawed cell phone data court cases. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, August 23rd, 2019. From Studio Feline, I'm Sarah Lane. From Brownstown, I'm Len Peralta. From Studio Snubs, I'm Shannon Morse. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. And I'm the assistant producer, Amos. You know, uh, a friendly patron of ours, Charles, wrote in and said, Amos kind of chimes in, but you don't introduce him at the top of the show. So we decided we're going to rectify that today. Thanks, Charles. And thanks, Amos, for being with us. Before the show, boy, we were talking about all sorts of stuff. Ketchup on noodles. Mm. Um, what else <laughs> were we talking about? We were all over the we were place. We are talking about TGIFs. TGIFs, <laughs> restaurant chains that we Banana Rama. Banana Rama, chicken. Chicken, <laughs> chicken sandwiches that Justin Robert Young is having a hard time getting. Oh, it was a good time on Good Day Internet. And you can join the conversation. We do it before and after DTNS by becoming a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. For now, let's start with a few tech things you should know. Google announced it shut down 210 YouTube channels that were spreading misinformation about protests in Hong Kong. Google security threat analysis group's Shane Huntley wrote in a blog post that the channels were shut down to combat coordinated influence operations and were using VPNs and other means to disguise their origin and activity. Earlier this week, Facebook and Twitter shut down several groups, in Twitter's case it was hundreds, and accounts under similar concerns. The average time to upgrade a smartphone has lengthened to 33 months, according to a new report from Strategy Analytics. The report also notes the average iPhone has been active for 18 months and the average Samsung phone 16.5 months. 7% of those surveyed indicated that they plan to spend over $1,000 to upgrade to their next smartphone, which may affect future 5G phone adoption as 5G is expected to raise prices overall. However, one out of four people surveyed Survey did say 5G will be an important factor when they do upgrade. Google confirmed it began rolling out the ability to search for text within images in Google Photos. The feature works with any images uploaded to the service, not just screenshots. Google Lens also integrates within the search, allow allowing text to be copied directly from the image. I'm going to use that all the time. The FAA published a notice that attaching weapons to drones is a bad idea, just in case you didn't know that already. Specifically, it warns, quote, perhaps you've seen online photos and videos of drones with attached guns, bombs, fireworks, flamethrowers, and other dangerous items. Do not consider attaching any items such as these to a drone because operating a drone with such an item may result in significant harm to a person and to your bank account. Those fines can reach $25,000 unless you first apply for FAA authorization and get approval for your drone weaponizing operation. Flame throwing drone in the backyard at the barbecue. <laughs> what could go wrong? Yeah, that's a hefty fine. Audible is being sued by seven members of the Association of American Publishers for copyright infringement over its planned rollout of a feature called Audible Captions that shows text on screen as a book is being narrated. HarperCollins publishers, Penguin Random House, Hachette Book Group, Simon & Schuster, and Macmillan publishers say that Audible needs their authorization as copyright holders and only has the right to sell the audiobooks. All right, let's talk a little bit more about data breaches. Shannon, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's as if you just bring them to us simply by being on the show. Sources tell Krebs on security <laughs> that more than 5.3 million accounts belonging to cardholders from 35 U.S. states and posted online came from compromised gas pumps, coffee shops, and restaurants operated by Hy-Vee, a Midwestern supermarket chain based in Des Moines, Iowa, with more than 245 retail locations. Hy-Vee announced on August 14th it was investigating a data breach involving payment processing systems that handled transactions within its various stores, but said at the time it was too early to tell when the breach began or for how long intruders were inside their systems. Hyvee says it doesn't believe that the breach affected payment and terminals used in its grocery store checkout lanes or its pharmacies or its convenience stores, has a lot of different kinds of stores, because those systems use point-to-point -point encryption to prevent card skimming malware. Shannon, you know, my first question was, well, okay, why don't we have point-to-point -point encryption on all of Hyvee's locations yes, and, and, and point-of-sales uh, 
why don't we have it on all the things? And uh, I, I remember when I used to work at a credit card processing uh, systems company that it was very expensive and kind of uh, it, it took a lot of merchants, a lot of time to be able to afford uh, getting these point of sale systems that were upgraded so that they were certified and compliant and actually installing them in all of their business places. So it's entirely possible in my mind that Hy-Vee may have been going through this process of upgrading and they decided to start with places like the restaurants and eventually work their way over to the grocery stores. Or maybe they're on completely different types of terminals uh, themselves that have to have a completely different process and maybe have to be upgraded with completely different equipment as well. Um, in my experience, a lot of the upgraded systems for point of sale cost uh, several th thousand dollars per checkout lane. So that is a really, really high cost uh, thing that you have to implement. But it's also very important because if something like this happens, Visa and MasterCard and other compliance um, uh, uh, companies will fine you millions of dollars. So it's it's a tough place. It's unfortunate. Uh, and I'm from the Midwest, so I'm very familiar with Hy-Vee and I know a lot of my family shop at that, those places too. So I know quite a few people are being impacted. Um, but yeah, that's like the life of being a small merchant and having to upgrade these machines is very, very expensive. Right. And even for a company like Hy-Vee, I mean, 245 retail locations, not the biggest chain, but, but pretty big, um, not, not a mom and pop, uh, operation by any means. But again, you, if we see this all the time, doesn't really matter how big or small the company is. If you're a small company, sure, price might just be the factor why you don't upgrade to a more secure system. But the fact that some some of their systems, you know, Hy-Vee is like, we're safe. This is this the data would not have been able to be collected um, by by using card skimming malware. But some of it would. And yeah, the question to me is kind of how long were they sitting around wondering? Uh, how how long can we stretch out the upgrade, which is going to, <laughs> which is going to be expensive before something like this happens? Or does it have to happen for a company to say, oh, this is a thing that just happened. Now we have to do this right. and hadn't even had a timeline for it in place already. And not only that, but they don't even know how long the criminals were targeting them or how long they were able to get access to their network. So this could be uh, something that hit, we know it hit five 0.3 million accounts, but we don't know how long they were actually in there. So people don't really know right now who was actually affected in that 5.3 million. Yep. So moving on, the Financial Times reports that three anonymous members of the Libra Association expressed concerns about being linked to the project in the wake of regulatory scrutiny. Two of the companies are reportedly considering pulling out of the project completely. One of the companies expressed frustration that Facebook didn't address potential regulatory concerns before the broader Libra Association announcement and said that Facebook is unhappy that Libra Association members aren't voicing support for the project. So you kind of you kind of have to sit back and say, did Facebook just not really realize that there would be the scrutiny that there is? And, and potential backlash from, from the government side of all this, because we're talking about money and currency and perhaps a new global currency? Or did Facebook, as, as it sounds like some of the partners are worried about, did they not really disclose that this was gonna be a messier rollout than the, the rainbows and unicorns announcement uh, that Facebook initially made Libra out to be? Right, and it's, it's unfortunate for these companies because a lot of them kind of, you know, shook on the fact that they would end up giving over $10 million uh, to help the growth of this, uh, this cryptocurrency, basically. So it's, uh, they have kind of a stake in it, they want to see it grow, because of course, they they would like to see more money come back to them in profits. Uh, but a lot of them pulling out at this point is looking really bad for Libra Association. And you're right, Sarah, it does sound like it, de it definitely sounds like there was some issues there with them not Facebook not necessarily paying attention to what kind of regulatory uh, positions you have to take when it comes to financials. And the whole point of the Libra Association, and this was a selling point that Facebook made very, very clearly um, when 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 it announced the the project was, don't worry, Facebook is only one of many members of this Libra Association. This is an independent association outside of the company. So anyone who's like, oh, Facebook's going to be controlling our money now, that was not the point. The strength was in the number 
of independent members of this association um, that could make decisions so that Facebook didn't have any sort of controlling stake in this operation. The fewer of those you have, the more it kind of falls back onto Facebook and the more the backlash is going to continue. What surprises me about the fact that they had so many uh, members that were a part of this is the fact that some of them were in, that were included were financial sector beings like mm -hmm. Visa and MasterCard. So given that you had so many different sectors that were kind of trying to join together and create this partnership, uh, I'm still I'm still kind of flabbergasted as to why they didn't think about these regulations beforehand and why this is now coming up. Earlier this week, we talked about Binance's Libra. Uh, well, Binance says, hey, we're just going to coexist. Their new uh, Venus um, stablecoin initiative, which doesn't even really work the same way. So the timing of all this is very interesting, uh, considering that it sounds like Libra is is going to be just one of um, some a variety of ways that that organizations, platforms, bank banks and the like are trying to tackle uh, the situation. So. Yeah, be an interesting ride, especially when Libra supposedly rolls out next year. Moving on to educational toys. Sphero is acquiring fellow entertainment and STEM toy maker Little Bits. Sphero gained notoriety, you might recall, with a smartphone controlled 3D printed ball at CES way back in 2011. It was, it was a big deal at CES. Uh, I was working at Twit at the time. We played around with one for a while. The same year, Little Bits introduced its own electronics kit. Both companies are alumni of Disney's Accelerator. Sphero's remote control BB-8 was the first in a line of Star Wars and Spider-Man and other Disney franchise licensed toys. Although in early 2018, Sphero's Disney deal ended and the company pivoted to educational toys, also had some layoffs. Little Bits had its own Marvel and Star Wars licensing deals, but that they, they had their own layoffs earlier this year as well and announced they would be shifting to K-12 educational toys. Also, Sphero and Little Bits as a combined company now hold 140 patents in the fields of robotics, electronics, software, and IoT. Match made in heaven, kind of. Yeah, it totally sounds like it. It almost seems like both of them were maybe like whispering behind the scenes about what they were kind of working on, both doing layoffs at the same time, both getting into the educational market at the same time. And now they're joining forces. Uh, and it does like Little Bits and Sphero have always been I've been somewhat of a fangirl of both of those companies for a very long time since they were first released, especially Little Bits, given that uh, it teaches kids so much about just coding and programming and the information behind hardware components and how you put those pieces together. Just a very fascinating concept that I wish was around when I was a kid. Um, but yeah, it's a total match made in heaven. I'm very excited for them. And it's no surprise it's happening right now. Uh, as we were discussing before recording, uh, there has been a slight drop off with uh, toy manufacturing and the sales of toys generically. However, they have seen a slight increase in toy sales during 2019. Um, so I'm not too surprised that they decided to push away from the toy market, the uh, like putting it in retail stores and whatnot and focusing on educational. Uh, with Sphero, they have had really awesome trends with schools, uh, which is a very hard market to kind of pop into. Uh, and I think that little bits joining forces with them will definitely increase that. And getting them into schools, I think, will be really, really useful to get more children involved in STEM. Absolutely. And, you know, it, depending on the school, of course, that might mean a uh, bigger package of toys sold at once, um, you know, reoccurring uh, uh, agreements uh, and, and, and partnerships with certain school districts. So getting into the education market sounds really smart for a toy company. But at the same time, even, you know, Roger was telling us before the show, if a toy is just a toy, well, OK, you know, kids like toys. But if a toy is an educational toy, and again, it depends on you know who's making it and, and what the intentions are. But if it's an educational toy that helps a kid learn, helps kid grow, helps it enrich, uh, you know, and you, know, you, it, you get something out of it while you're having fun, that's even better. I mean, almost any toy should be marketing itself as educational on some level, right? <laughs> because it's like the, the, everybody wins. The adults like it and the kids like it. They would sell so much more. <laughs> exactly. Uh, the Wall Street Journal reports that more than 4,000 unsafe or banned products are alive and well on Amazon, offered through third-party sellers. The publication's in investigation discovered items such as toys, like we were just speaking about, and medication that have been declared unsafe or banned by federal agencies or have misleading titles 
or labels. The journal says Amazon has since removed or changed the description on more than half of the problematic listings. Amazon also responded to the story in a blog post saying that it requires products on its site to comply with, quote, relevant laws and regulations and uses automated tools that scan for non-compliant products. Earlier this year, the company changed its quality control standards for school supplies and children's jewelry sold on its platform after some were found to have unsafe levels of toxic metals. Legitimate third-party sellers have also been unfairly punished after being reported as selling counterfeit goods by rivals, underscoring the difficulty Amazon has policing millions and millions of sellers. Yeah, this is like too too big to police effectively. Uh, Amazon is probably the most obvious example of this. Amazon does have millions of third-party sellers. Amazon says, "Hey, they agree when they become a, a seller of, you know, a, you know, we enter into a partnership that they're not going to do this and we have automated systems in place to try to weed this stuff out before it ever reaches the consumer's eyes or is able to be bought." But as we have talked about a lot on the show as of late that automated systems miss stuff. Um, Amazon is going to be having to pull a lot more of these because things are slipping through the cracks. And in some cases, I think it was, gosh, a couple of years ago now, there was a case where Amazon was got sued because it sold a third party hoverboard that exploded, burned down somebody's house. And in that case, it was just one case, but the court ruled I mean, you know, this was Amazon was merely the facilitator between the seller and the buyer and and it, it shouldn't be at fault. And that, again, those cases, they don't always go the same way as that particular one. But I don't know exactly what Amazon does in this situation unless it has more stringent policies on third party sellers, which would reduce the amount of third party sellers, which they don't want to do either. Oh, of course not, because they're making a profit. They they make a percentage on each sale that happens through their platform. Um, I'm somewhat familiar with the process of selling on Amazon due to some friends that sell stuff there too. And uh, they've even seen these kind of problems where something might get banned or cut off because Amazon, uh, their automatic processing does not understand what the product is. Uh, for example, Hack5 has tried to sell products on Amazon and had things just randomly turned off and then we had to get in touch with a person and that whole thing is a huge debacle in itself as a third party seller um the but the fact that so many thousands of toys and thousands of medical devices are getting out there medication uh and th that are potentially dangerous for people to use that's a really serious problem and amazon really needs to figure out a way to fix this because they could be i mean they could be sued for oh, potential yeah. damages. Oh, for sure. Yeah. If I buy a t-shirt and it comes and I'm like, well, this wasn't the quality I thought it was. Well, that's, that's a bummer. one thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But if it's a toy that's going to hurt a little kid um, or medication that, that, that is not what it says it is, you know, for, for somebody who has a legitimate health issue, that, uh, that, that, that is an issue. Um, and it's w without outright banning certain products on the Amazon side, the company doing that, and it has its work cut out for it. DoorDash unveiled its updated tipping policy. Talked about DoorDash, had a tipping policy that was pretty controversial, angered some drivers. Well, the company says all drivers now receive 100% of tips placed through its app. So if I get food delivered, I like my experience, the driver gets 100% of the tip that I think is going to the driver in the first place. Drivers also will see a breakdown of a delivery total, including any tip prior to accepting an order. The new policy is testing now and expected to roll out in September. Meanwhile, in similar news, the LA Times reports that Amazon emailed Flex drivers they deliver a variety of products, announcing it would no longer use supplemental earnings or tips to cover their minimum pay. Going forward, Amazon will provide drivers with a full breakdown of pay, including how much comes from tips. An Amazon spokesperson said that the company would contribute at least $15 per scheduled hour to driver pay, with some regions receiving higher minimum contributions. I have beef with these companies <laughs> and, and using tips to give their drivers minimum wage, which they should be fairly paid already. Um, the fact that customers had no clue that this was being used as part of their minimum wage is unfair in so many ways. And mm -hmm. so is tipping in itself in the United States. I mean, I used to deliver pizza for Domino's Pizza when I was a kid. And if 
if I wasn't receiving those tips, I probably would not have been able to, you know, pay for school when I was in college. Yeah. So I have lots of venting issues with these companies, but even in itself, like it's, it just seems very unfair. And how is a customer supposed to know, like, if, if you're putting in the tip in, into the application beforehand, like all of these companies seem to be going to, which is good. I'm glad you're allow, allowing customers to tip uh, within the app and giving the drivers 100%. But how is a customer supposed to know that they're going to have a good experience with the driver even? Like part of the whole tipping lifestyle in the US is you tip based on, you know, 15% or 20% and you kind of base that on the experience and how good the customer service is with the person that was involved. Yeah. It's kind of like if nothing went wrong, you tip what is expected. If something was way above and beyond, maybe you go higher. And then of course, if it's lower, it's like something terrible happened, you know, and, and that person isn't going to get the minimum tip that is polite to do. Yeah. You know, unless I'm not understanding this correctly, I thought that that was weird too, at least about the DoorDash part of this that a driver would be able to go, huh, okay, here's, you know, here's what the delivery and then my tip will be before I go ahead and accept this. Because the tip comes afterwards. I, I'm, I'm, I'm pro tipping. I'm happy to tip. Uh, but if you've already gotten tipped before you've done your job, then what is the tip? That's almost yeah. just sort of like <laughs> the payment, the premium payment. But, and I, and I know a lot of folks listening to D TNS are just shaking their heads because in many parts of the world, you don't have this problem. <laughs> Because you're paying you have, fairly already. The confusion of tipping is something that is certainly uh, very U.S. centric. I to this day, there are certain uh, services that people provide where I go, like, do I tip the guy who like gave me the new router? I don't, you know, it's, it's it, yeah. It is. It is. It continues to be a confusing thing. I generally befall on the idea of, oh, are you allowed to take tips? And if they say yes, then I'm like, okay, I'll tip you. And I always try to tip in cash so that I don't have to deal with the company trying to take their money away from them. Yeah. Uh, however, you should always make sure that you claim your taxes on your cash. <laughs> Not that we always do. Authorities in Denmark will review 10,700 court cases dating back to 2012 to see if flawed cell phone evidence was used for convictions. On Monday, the nation's director of public prosecutions ordered a two-month halt in the use of cell phone data in criminal prosecution cases. The review stems from two different flaws. The first one is the system that turns a phone company's raw data into location data was omitted, omitting data during the conversion. And the second problem is that some cell phone tracking data linked phones to the wrong cell phone towers, possibly incriminating in innocent people. So the authority said that the problem stemmed partly from police IT systems and partly from the phone company's systems, although a telecom industry representative said he could not understand how phone companies could have caused the errors. Well, Ooh. if the cell tower is linking me to a place I never was where the crime occurred, but in my court case, it was determined I was there yeah. through through <laughs> cell tower data, I would like my case revisited. I mean, we're talking 10,700 court cases here. There's going to be yes. some instances where, where things are overturned for that exact reason. And they don't give exact numbers, a uh, breakdown of how many people are currently going through the court process, how many are have already been imprisoned how many people this may potentially uh, actually like have this data uh, make a difference in their case and would have to go back to trial. Uh, so at this moment where they're just reviewing those 10,700 court cases, it will likely be a lot less once they do determine how many it actually affects. But this is a really serious problem. Uh, you have a, a lot of cases, especially coming up in the past decade or so, that have, uh, you know, cell phone information that links people to these these uh, convictions. Mm -hmm. And uh, this data could eventually overturn a case of somebody that's been in prison for a long time. Like that's uh, that's a huge concern, especially since it's in Denmark. I mean, does that affect other company or other countries as well? Well, yeah. I mean, this this is the big thing. Is you know one of the one, one of the things that's kind of underscored here is that if this happened in Denmark, which generally is considered to have a pretty uh, transparent and, and functional cr uh, criminal justice system, how many other countries around the globe might have similar issues? Um, and it's 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 one of those things where. Oftentimes, technology is kind of used as like, well, the technology says you did it, so you must be guilty. 
um, and it, it tends to kind of subsume any other sort of legwork that typically goes into a criminal investigation. Um, and it should be a cause for alarm for, for people who uh, are, you know, do want to make sure that the, the criminal justice system is f- indeed fair and, you know, justice is served, right? You don't want to put the wrong person in jail because that ostensibly means the person who was guilty is running around free. Well, this is also, we're moving in the right direction, right? You know, there there are there are cases that are overturned constantly now because we have the ability to test DNA when somebody was wrongfully uh, accused, convicted, and, and, and possibly imprisoned in the past. So this is... A, this is, not, this is not science in the same way at all, but it's, you know, assuming that nobody was uh, tampering with any data in this case, it was simply flaws that had not been caught in the past. The fact that this is something that is known that may affect cases where, you know, justice was not served <laughs> is is a good thing. It's a messy thing, certainly. And yeah, I mean, if this is happening in Denmark, how many other countries are affected? How many other cases are affected? Potentially quite a few more than 10,000. But um but it's yeah. better than the alternative. I, f- I feel like, and perhaps you're feeling the same way, Sarah, that this is going to have really major implications uh, worldwide for cases uh, in the future that have to do with cell phone information. And it'll probably make it a lot more scrutinized than it currently is, because as, as the articles report, uh, and as Roger mentioned, a lot of times lawyers just look at it and, they, and, and the jury looks at it and they just assume that this data is correct because data is always correct, but it can be flawed in some way if it was originally created in the incorrect fashion or if, you know, the, the data was omitted in this case it was. Uh, mm-hmm. So huge implications for what's going to happen in the future when it comes down to this kind of data being used. And if it can't be fixed or it can't be trusted to be correct, right? Can yeah. it be admitted into court at all? That's something they never even mentioned is whether or not this is something that's fixable. So if they are going to go back and review these, I would love to know how they are going to look at this data and how they are going to see if it's uh, something that they can fix. Well, folks, to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. Also, thanks to everyone who participates in our subreddit. Such a good crew we have in there. You can submit stories you think we should know about and vote on others at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Also, we're on Facebook. Join our group, facebook.com slash groups slash dailytechnewsshow. Got a couple mailbags today. First one from Garrick. He's from Grand Rapids, Michigan. And he wanted to weigh in on that uh, conversation we had on Tuesday about subscription fatigue and cord cutting. Garrick says... Seems people in the U.S. have forgotten how awful local network and cable affiliates treat their customers. I don't know if everybody has forgotten that, Garrick, but I get your point. He says, our access to cable channels in his neck of the woods and broadcast syndication packages have always been dependent on local affiliates. Growing up near northern Indiana, we didn't have access to the CW, the WB, Comedy Central, or many other stations until the mid-2000s. The University of Notre Dame owned our local NBC affiliate at one point and refused to broadcast certain NBC programming, such as Conan O'Brien's show. He says, don't even get me started on all the times that nationally broadcast primetime television had been kicked off the air in favor of sporting events. Before complaining about the cost of a streaming service, people should be thankful that ISPs don't control Hulu content and that Netflix doesn't remove BoJack Horseman from their service every November to make room for local high school football. (laughs) <laughs> uh, I I feel your pain in so many ways, Garrett, because I have been there when I lived in Missouri, and we would have to watch high school football instead of whatever show was on TV, and I had no interest in football, so I totally feel you. However, I still am going to complain about the prices, right. and part of, that, part of that reasoning is because I remember living in the Midwest and trying to watch a show on Netflix when it was first around, and the buffering took four ever. And I was like, why am I paying, you know, I think it was like seven bucks a month at the time. Why am I paying $7 a month for something that's buffering for half an hour for me to watch a 25 minute show? It was just, it, it, it was still ridiculous at that time. Yeah, I, I'm with you. I didn't even, I mean, there was no cable where I was. There were, literally, we could not get cable in the forest where I lived uh, until well into high school. 
boy, was that a new world. But yes, the, the, <laughs> I, I had not really thought about the, that whole affiliate thing and how it might be different depending on where you live. So thanks, Garrick. Uh, someone who chose to remain anonymous also wrote in about our recent discussion on essay grading, robots versus humans, what's better, and uh, the automation of it all. Uh, they said, somebody brought up that teachers are not the ones grading standardized tests anyway. Anonymous says, I can confirm this. Both my sister and brother work for Pearson. I've known others as well. They both started out grading essays for standardized tests. There's training for the people they hire, and there's QC to make sure that grading standards are maintained. From what I can tell, the majority of positions at Pearson are temporary, including the supervisors and tra trainers for the graders. This makes some sense because standardized testing is seasonal, but I think it makes it hard for them to maintain a quality group of employees. With many proposed or already implemented automated tasks, people seem to get really nervous. What they might fail to realize is that the quality of current methods for accomplishing the same task. We expect computers and robots to be perfect before we trust them, when in many cases it doesn't have to be anywhere near that good to be better than current systems, aka humans. Well, as long as it's not like Amazon's banning of, <laughs> of third-party uh, sellers, uh, I think anything's better. <laughs> Yeah. Well, thanks everybody for, for writing in and giving us your perspective. Always helpful. And also thanks to Lynn Peralta, who's been busy illustrating this entire show. We're just going to focus on one subject for now, Len. Uh, but uh, what do you got for us? Well, a lot of really good stuff to talk about this week, but I focused on what uh, Shannon was talking about, which was banning, uh, you know, all the, all the uh, unsafe and banned products on Amazon. Uh, and I focused on the baby products because I'm sure there's a ton of baby products on there. And uh, here are just a few of them. A couple of them, <laughs> I think, are kind of fun. There's old choke em up baby formula. This is regurgitated bile flavor. Mm -hmm. uh, there's the painfully tight brand diapers. And my favorite, the piranhas, G-N-A-W-S, the real piranha that eats your child's arm. So uh, that that should probably be banned off Amazon. I don't know how it ended up on there. What the heck? Wow, you really had fun today, didn't you? Oh, I love doing these. These are the fun <laughs> ones. <laughs> really fun stuff. Yeah. Uh, this is available on my online store, lenperaltestore.com. Or if you're a Patreon backer, uh, you can get it right now. It's available right now, patreon.com forward slash Len. Awesome work as always, Len. And thanks to Shannon Morse for being with us this Friday. Shannon, let folks know what they can keep up with the rest of what you do. Thank you so much, Sarah. And I promise I won't bring hacking to every single show. It's not my fault. <laughs> no, it's definitely not your fault. You, some, you somehow conjure up stories that I know you're going to be good at explaining. So I thank you. I'm a security and privacy witch. <laughs> right. uh, yeah, ThreatWire, patreon.com slash ThreatWire or youtube.com slash HAK5. Uh, this week, I talked a lot about warshipping, where people are sending hacking devices into companies using uh, UPS and USPS and other shippers. And also a new Bluetooth vulnerability, which hits um, lots of lots and lots of devices. So it's called the knob attack, laugh if you must. Uh, and it's a pretty serious vulnerability. So definitely check it out if you haven't already. Uh, the episode is free up on the YouTubes. Well, thanks to Lan and Shannon for being with us today. Also, thanks to our patrons. Couldn't do the show without you. We are a strong army. Thank you, patrons. You can become a DTNS patron as well. Get an ad-free RSS feed, lots of behind-the-scenes stuff, special episodes, newsletters. It's a fun place to be. Patreon.com slash DTNS. And thanks to everybody who supports our show. You want to email us? Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is where to send it. You want to join us live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. Put it on your calendar. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Tom Merritt is back on Monday. Have a great weekend. See you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Frog Pants Network. Get more shows like this at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>